Well, 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 here we are. Another Serial Killer Saturday. You know, as I look for a person to feature on the channel, I am often surprised, not only at the actions of the featured villain, but also by the fact that I had never personally heard of them before. Enriqueta Marti, also known as the Vampire of Barcelona. She was a child murderer, kidnapper, and procuress of children. To put that last part simply, she was a child pimp. Number of known victims is more than 10, although it is believed that the real number is well into the hundreds for a few reasons. The first being that she was in operation for over 20 years. The second, because she used the remains of many of her victims once she had her use or fill of them, or her clients did, as ingredients to her medicinal potions, cures, and lotions as well as keeping several aliases and several residences with those aliases, often making the children that she kidnapped call her mother or stepmother as to not arise suspicion. Enriqueta never gave birth to a single child herself. Dates of murders occurred between 1902 in 1912. Her date of arrest was February 27th, 1912. She was born in 1868 in Barcelona, Spain. She was never tried and died in prison on May 12th, 1913. As a young woman, Enriqueta worked as a maidservant and nanny, but soon turned to prostitution both in brothels and in places dedicated to this activity. In 1895, she married a painter called Juan Poalo, but the marriage failed. According to Poalo, Enriqueta's affairs with other men, her strange, false, unpredictable character, and her continuous visits to houses of disrepute caused the separation. In spite of marriage, she continued to visit locales of prostitution and people of doubtful virtue. The pair reconciled and separated approximately six times. At the time of Enriqueta's detention in 1912, the couple had been separated for five years. Enriqueta was leading a double life. During the day, she dressed in rags and begged at houses of charity, convents, and parishes in the destitute parts of town where she selected children who looked the most abandoned. Taking the children by the hand, she made them pass as her children. Later, she prostituted or murdered them. She did not have any need to beg since her double work as a procurer and prostitute gave her sufficient money to live well. By night, she dressed in luxurious clothes, hats, and wigs, and attended places where the wealthy of Barcelona gathered. It is probable that in these places, she offered her services as procurer of children. In 1909, she was arrested in her flat in Barcelona, accused of running a brothel that offered sexual services from children between the ages of 3 and 14. With her, a young man of wealthy family was arrested. Thanks to her contacts in high Barcelona society that were contracting her services as a procurer of children, Enriqueta was never tried, and the matter of the brothel was lost in the judicial and bureaucratic system. 
At the same time as she was prostituting children, she was also practicing as a witch doctor. The ingredients she used to make her remedies were made from the remains of the children that she was killing, who ranged from infants up to the children of nine years of age. From these children, she used everything that she could, the fat, blood, hair, and bones that normally she turned into powder. For this reason, she did not have problems disposing of the bodies of her victims. Enriqueta offered salves, ointments, filters, cataplasms, and potions, especially to treat tuberculosis, which was highly feared at the time, and all kinds of diseases that did not have a cure in traditional medicine. Wealthy people were paying large sums of money for these remedies. She was finally arrested in a flat, mezzanine number 29 of Ponent Street. More evidence was found in flats in Barcelona where she had lived previously. The forensic experts managed to differentiate a total of 12 children with what little evidence they were able to recover. In spite of suspicions and because Enriqueta did not tally her activities, experts are unsure if she was indeed the deadliest killer that has existed in Spain. It is clear that she acted for many years in Barcelona. Additionally, the public suspected that someone was kidnapping babies. There were many children who disappeared without a trace, and there was dread among the population. On February 10th, 1912, she kidnapped her last victim. Teresita Guitar. For two weeks, the city looked for her, and in the midst of the search, there was great public indignation since the authorities had been extremely passive regarding the missing children. It would be a suspicious neighbor, Claudia Elias, who would find Teresita's trail. On February 17th, Elias saw a girl with cropped hair looking from a casement from the interior court of her stairs. The flat was mezzanine number 29, Ponent Street. Elias had never seen this girl. The little one was playing with another child, and Claudia asked her neighbor when she saw her appear in the window if the girl was hers. The neighbor in question was Enriqueta, who closed the window without saying a word. Surprised, Claudia Elias commented on the fact to a mattress maker down the street and that she suspected that the little girl was Teresita. She also informed him of the strange life that her neighbor was leading. The mattress maker informed a municipal agent. He, in turn, communicated this to the chief of the brigade. On February 27th, with the excuse of a complaint about the possession of chickens in the flat. Agents went to look for Enriqueta, and they found her in the court of Ferlandina Street and informed her of the accusation, then escorted her to her flat. She proved to be surprised, but did not object. When the policeman entered, two girls were found in the flat. One of them was Teresita, and another girl called Angelita. After a statement, Teresita was returned to her parents. She explained how Enriqueta took her by the hand, promising her candies. Teresita realized that she was being taken too far from her house and wanted to return, so Enriqueta covered her with a black rag and forced her to the flat at mezzanine number 29. After reaching the flat, Enriqueta cut Teresita's hair and changed her name to Felicidad. She then told the child she no longer had parents and was to call her stepmother from then on. Enriqueta fed Teresita potatoes and stale bread and preferred to pinch rather than beat the child. The girl was prohibited from going out to the windows and balconies as well as several rooms in the flat. 
Tara Sita also told authorities that Enraqueta was in the habit of leaving the two girls alone and that one day they risked exploring the rooms that Enraqueta forbid them to enter. In this adventure, they found a sack with girls' clothes covered with blood and a boning knife also covered with blood. Teresita never left the flat during her captivity. Angelita's declaration was more frightening. Before Teresita's arrival to the flat, there was a five-year-old called Pepito. Angelita said that she secretly saw Enriqueta, who she was calling mom, kill him on the kitchen table. Enriqueta did not realize that the girl had seen her, and Angelita ran to hide in the bed and pretended to be sleeping. Angelita's identity was more difficult to pinpoint because of the vagueness of Enriqueta's first statements. The girl did not know her real surname and affirmed Enriqueta's claim that her father was called Juan. Enriqueta maintained that Angelita was her daughter by her estranged husband. Juan Poalo presented himself before the judge of his own will after he discovered his wife's arrest and declared that he had not lived with her for years and that he had not had children and he did not know where Angelita had came from. Eventually, Enriqueta stated that she had taken Angelita as a newborn from her sister-in-law, whom she made believe that the girl had died at birth. Enriqueta was detained and deposited in the Rina Amalia prison. In the second inspection of the flat, detectives found the sack with the bloody clothing and the knife. They also found another sack with dirty clothes and at least 30 human bones of small dimensions. The bones showed evidence that they had been exposed to fire. Investigators found a lounge sumptuously decorated with a cupboard with nice clothes for a boy and a girl. This lounge contrasted with the rest of the flat, which was austere and impoverished and smelled badly. In another locked room, they found the horror that Enriqueta was hiding. Inside of it were 50 pitchers, jars, and wash bowls with preserved human remains, greasy lard, coagulated blood, children's hair, skeletons of hands, powdered bones, and pots with the potions, ointments, and salves already prepared for sale. Investigators also went to two more flats where Enriqueta had lived, as well as a little house. In them, they found false walls, and in the ceilings, human remains. In the garden of the house, they found a skull of a three-year-old child, and a series of bones that corresponded to three, six, and eight-year-old children. Some remains still had pieces of clothing, which gave investigators the understanding that Enriqueta had habitually kidnapped children of impoverished families, which also meant they did not have the means to look for their missing children. Further investigation revealed more housing, property of Enriqueta's family. Here they found remains of children in vases and jars, as well as books of remedies. The house belonged to the Marti family and was known in the population by the nickname of Lindo. Juan Pualo claimed that he was barred from the property because of the bad administration of Enriqueta's father. In one flat, they found curious things. An ancient book with parchment covers, a book of notes where she had written recipes and potions and elegant calligraphy 
a package of letters and notes written in coded language, and a list with names of families and very important figures in Barcelona. This list was very controversial since among the population it was believed that it was the list of Enriqueta's rich clients. The public believed that the suspected clients would not pay for their crimes of pedophilia or of buying human remains to treat their health because of their wealth. The police tried to stop the list from leaking, but rumors ran that it was a list of doctors, politicians, businessmen, and bankers. Out of the fear of a public riot, the authorities calmed the public with newspaper articles explaining that in the famous list were the names of people who Enriqueta begged, and that these families and personalities had been swindled by the lies and requests of the murderer. Enriqueta was imprisoned in Rina Amalia jail to wait judgment. She tried to commit suicide by slashing her wrists with a wooden knife. Public indignation exploded because the people wanted Enriqueta to face trial and execution by the garret. The authorities of the prison made known through the press that measures had been taken to ensure that Enriqueta was not left alone. Three inmates with more authority in the prison were sharing cell with her. They had instructions to uncover her in bed when she had covered herself to avoid any hidden suicide attempt. Enriqueta was never tried for her crimes. She died a year and three months after her arrest and passed the public outrage at the hands of her prison mates. Her companions in prison killed her by lynching her in one of the prison patios. The untimely death of Enriqueta robbed authorities of the opportunity to completely expose all of her secrets. The kidnapper and murderer died on May 12, 1913. Officially, it is documented as a long illness, but the truth was it was a consequence of a brutal beating. She was buried secretly in a common grave situated on a mountain in Barcelona. There are no records of her early life, at least none that I could find. So there is no way to know what drove this woman to do such vile things. But as we have discovered in many of these cases, sadly, money talks. Allowing criminals and those seeking their services unspoken immunity from their crimes. Thankfully, in today's day and age, we are getting better and better at tracking down those who would commit such atrocities. Unfortunately, some are still slipping under the radar, stealing children and passing them off as their own right in front of our very eyes. If you have a serial killer you would like to see featured here, please contact me through any of my social media links or leave a comment or a message here. See you next time.